it is time. We dwarves return to Moria. The Lord of the Rings Return to Moria might lovingly depict one of the most recognizable fantasy worlds ever created, but to my surprise, that's not actually the most recognizable thing about it. This is a survival game first and a Lord of the Rings game second, content to replicate all the familiar mechanics of the genre while leaning heavily on its Tolkien backdrop to compensate for a lack of original ideas. Oh, Lord Gimli, this is another sign! If you've played any survival game in the last 15 years, you'll immediately know what you're in for as you build bases, cook food, upgrade your pickaxes to mine better ores, craft armor and weapons to fight hordes of enemies, and run back home when it gets dark. The trouble is, there's no part of the tried and true survival blueprint that Return to Moria does better than games that came before it. And there are some parts, like the terrible combat and constraining building, that are significantly worse than most. Interestingly, Return to Moria's story takes place during a wholly underdeveloped era of Middle-earth's canon, the Fourth Age, after the conclusion of the War of the Ring. Everyone's favorite dwarf and occasional projectile, Gimli, who is once again voiced by movie trilogy actor John Rhys Davis, If the king wants to stop us, he can come himself! has called all the dwarf factions back to Moria in order to reclaim it from the goblins, orcs, and dark forces who have taken over. Cleanse the world from the shadow of the ring and its master. As one of those summoned dwarves, you and up to seven friends are sent into the menacing bowels of the Lost Kingdom to cook rat meat, decorate hastily assembled hovels, and juggle dozens of materials between haphazardly placed chests like the unrepentant hoarder you are. That said, most of that story is little more than a series of excuses to reference the events of Fellowship of the Ring, like when you find the stone Pippin threw down the well, or walk through the room where Frodo's mithril saved him from an otherwise fatal blow. It's not that the story is bad overall, and I can forgive a certain amount of fan service in a Lord of the Rings game. The larger issue with it is that you spend about 95% of the journey, which took me nearly 45 hours to complete, jogging through dark corridors and beating up irritating goblins, so it's easy to forget there's any kind of plot to follow to begin with. Occasionally, though, it reminds you that you're in Middle-earth in endearing ways, namely through song. If you've ever read a Tolkien book, then you know the man could only go a few pages before he felt the insurmountable urge to lay down a beat, and I love how much Return to Moria pays tribute to that legacy. Not that there be more, they poured the milk on the pantry floor when Philly and Killy came knocking at Fiddle's door. If you get drunk with your comrades, you'll all start dancing and singing some epic ballad about your people's history. And during key story moments, you'll break out some especially stirring songs. The world was young, the mountains green, no stain yet on the moon was seen. Filled with lore and a whole lot of heart. Hold up, seriously, guys? Hold on a sec, everyone. Perfect! We got orcs! Ah! Rally together. Bring your axes and tools. The main thing Return to Moria gets right is the almost rhythmic pattern of gathering more and better resources to feed your growing base building needs. That loop of exploring deeper and deeper into a dangerous mine filled with monsters as you collect resources and improve your character can be entertaining. You'll need to acquire rarer raw materials, upgrade your gear, and improve the accommodations at your base to make the going easier, like a very necessary keg filled with beer to maintain morale. This loop will be very familiar to anyone who stayed up too late, running around in Minecraft, or slaying giant spiders in Grounded. So we're not exploring new territory here, but it's extremely important that Return to Moria at least retreads that ground well. Unfortunately, the actual building, combat, and especially exploration that come along with that generally enjoyable grind all miss the mark, and all for the same reason. 
a shocking absence of freedom. While you can set up a base from scratch almost anywhere, each new zone has at least one or two preset campsites that are extremely beneficial to use as starting points, making it very difficult to justify dumping a bunch of resources into making a camp anywhere else. And even when I did decide to go rogue and settle down in a place of my choosing, most of the time the building options were so frustratingly finicky it made me regret the undertaking. In one case, I spent half an hour trying to build a second story for my base that kept collapsing due to some unspecific rules regarding load-bearing structures. And in another, I immediately realized the area I'd chosen was diagonally oriented on Return of Moria's grid-based map, meaning every single structure I placed, well, looked like this. It's nice and tight. Come on, help him out. Even worse is combat, which is a very dull pattern of blocking, stabbing, or shooting arrows with only a few weapon types that feel far too similar, which is a major ball to drop since Return to Moria has you doing a whole heck of a lot of it. Goblins, orcs, and uruks spawn all over the map whenever you're not looking, raise an army against you whenever your mining and exploration create too much noise, and assault your bases with intent to destroy them on a regular basis. Some of these fights amount to 15 to 20 minutes of this. The enemy AI is very bad too. They constantly get stuck on top of and inside their surroundings, allow you to stand at a safe distance and pick them off with ranged attacks, and repeat the same attacks over and over again, letting you spam the same response a dozen times before they finally go down for the count. Every once in a while, you get a new enemy type like a drake or a troll to contend with, but even these fall victim to terrible AI, quickly casting any excitement straight into the fires of Mount Doom. Return to Moria also makes the perplexing choice of not actually letting you mine in any direction you want. You can only really dig through laughably small hallways that connect one area to another. No Man's Sky and Ark have longevity because there's no end to the ways you can make the world your own, build creative and interesting bases, and express yourself. Return to Moria has bafflingly little of that. Even mining is limited to shallow deposits like these before you hit another impenetrable barrier. It's just wild to play as a dwarf in a mine without being able to actually dig through basically anything. On the bright side, all the areas you encounter along the way have a lot of personality to them, from the elven quarter filled with trees and beauty to some gross depths covered in glowing mushrooms and clouds of poisonous corruption. Highlighting one of the only ways Return to Moria differentiates itself from its peers, traveling through this underground kingdom's linear path feels like a proper Lord of the Rings adventure. That does make the journey a bit more linear than your typical survival game, but in the tradition of Tolkien adventures that lead the heroes on a harrowing adventure from one part of Middle-earth to another, it just feels right. And yet, even when it feels right, things are still going wrong. One of the areas Return to Moria falls shortest is in its consistently poor performance, from bugs like items disappearing to issues like unstable frame rates and abnormally long loading times. There are even extreme cases, like how some areas fail to load before you get there, exposing developer objects like immersion ruining walls separating two parts of the map that don't disappear until you've gotten entirely too close to them. In fact, there are only a few cases where Return to Moria ever looks good or performs well at all, and it seems to get worse when more players are added to a world. That's especially true if you aren't the host. Durin, Durin the Deathless has not returned. As a big fan of both the Lord of the Rings and survival games, I was enticed by the idea that I can dive into a genre I already know and love with the rich lore of Middle-earth to keep me company, as well as a party of friends. But it's disappointing to see such a promising concept do little more than a barely passable impression of better games. Combat is dull and repetitive, owing to overused enemy types and brain-dead AI and limited mining opportunities or freedom with settlement building throws a wet blanket over the creativity that's typically a selling point for the genre. 
throw in rough technical performance, and it becomes difficult to recommend Return to Moria to even my fellow Tolkien stands. There's a decent game in here somewhere, as the compelling progression loop and chaotic multiplayer capabilities can make for a really good time. I just can't give you many reasons to pick this survival game over the plethora of better options when it's only ever by the numbers at best. You did your best. On to plan B. For more, check out our reviews of Ghost Runner 2 and Cities Skylines 2. And for everything else, stick with IGN. The milk on the pantry floor when Philly and Killy came knocking at Bill's door.